Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I will start with a question for Joanna. Um, this is, I think we, we can surmise, and it's also been written about, that this is a semi-autobiographical film that draws on um, a period of your life in your early 20s. Um, I'm just wondering, when did you decide to make a film about this period of your life, and why, why did you think this was the right time? Uh, well, I, I first started thinking about it, um, just a few ideas about making it in, in 19, summer of 1988, so three years after the end of uh, the relationship on which the story is based. Um, and I only recently found the notes about it, and, and, and I hadn't realized until very recently that I had always thought it should be in two parts. I thought there should be the, the, the relationship and then the aftermath of it. And uh, so it's, yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes you don't realize it, but, but yeah, these ideas are, 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 are wearing around. And, and, I, and I, I, I felt I was very clear at the time that although I was writing notes about it, I, I, I didn't feel that I had the capacity to really digest and remember what happened. I somehow thought that I had to understand not just my own viewpoint of this period of time, but that I needed to know and understand the, the, the Anthony character's viewpoint. And I didn't have confidence that I could tell his story. And, and, I, and that continued for a number of years because every now and again, the idea of doing it would come back to me um, uh, just on and off. You know, sometimes a couple of years would pass and I wouldn't think about it. And then, um, yes, then, uh, what was it, three years ago now, um, I thought it was, uh, I thought I was ready, ready to, to tell the story, but that also that I, I let go of the idea that I had to understand his point of view, um, and even my own point of view in a way that I could just create an impression of, 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 of that story. I th it's interesting that it took you more than 30 years. Um, I, I think in some ways it's, you know, it's really a film that um, is about finding the right distance to, I think it's a film that finds the right distance to its characters, to the time period, to the stage of life, you know, and I think that's sort of, for me, what the film is about in some ways. Um, and I, I wanted to bring Tilda in because you've known Joanna since the mid 80s, yes, or? A or lot, lot, lot before that. A lot before that, okay. So it's you. Early you, 70s. At least, oh wow, okay. So I know that you were in um, Tilda's, uh, you were in Joanna's thesis film. Uh, and this was from 1986? Yes, yes, yes. But Tilda was also in the rehearsal, which is depicted, the making of it is depicted at the end of the souvenir. Okay. So in fact, for the sake of shorthand, I am the girl who's the best friend of Julie. Okay, wow. Um, so can you, in terms of, you know, in some ways it's a memory piece, you know, I'm wondering if you, what those memories were. I mean, we see some of those artifacts in the film. We see photographs, we see footage, we see, I mean, recreations. And did you draw on memories of others? I'm wondering, people like, you know, like Tilda, who you were close to and, and, and knew and, and worked with at the time. Uh, I, yes, I drew, drew on a lot of things. I've never really trusted my memory. I think that was another reason why it took so long to make the film. And I, I still don't, in a way. And I still don't know how accurate I've been, in a sense. But it, I was helped by obviously Tilda remembering that time, and then the um, the, the the artifacts you see in the film, or like the photographs and the Super 8 film. They're all that, yours, right? That's all mine, and and so that sort of helps uh, give a sense of that time period, I guess. Yeah. Since since we have all of you here, I'd I I think it's it, it's a it's a great opportunity to talk about your your process, which I think is is really singular. I don't think anybody else works this way, or certainly gets results like this <laughs> with this method of working. Um, it's been described as an, you know, improvisation, but I, I'm not sure it's, that exactly captures what, what happens with you and your collaborators. There's, um, you don't have traditional shooting scripts, as I understand it, right? No, 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 no. Which is, I think, kind of insane <laughs> when you think about how precise your films are. Uh, and I, I just would love to hear you talk about 
how you get everybody to this sort of space of like collaborative attunement where you must be uh, working together on some <laughs> some level. Um, and I'd love to hear, you know, from your point of view as, as, as in terms of writing and shooting and then also from, from the actors. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's a little bit of a mystery even to myself in a way. But, I mean, taking the souvenir as, as the example, obviously the recent example, um, there's something about conjuring up uh, something from your past. And this was the first time I'd, I'd, I'd done this. It was, we, we, we built the, um, the flat that I lived in at that period of, uh, of the 80s. And, and, and um, something we've talked about. It, I think in, in, in sort of imagining and building this place from the past, that in itself uh, brought lots of memories back to me. It was a very powerful thing, having, having this place that I built um, um, from memory because we weren't able to visit the original apartment um, and then be able to stand in this place when it was still just a, a skeleton, just a form, we hadn't finished building it. And, and I suddenly realized what the shapes were or, or where the kitchen was wide, it should be narrower or something should be different or this object, object should go there. And it was extraordinary how, yes, all, 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 all these ideas came back. But then, then beyond that, then it's placing the, the um, you know, it's placing Honor and Tom and Tilda and other characters in, in this space. And I think they, by some kind of magic or osmosis, um, pick up the, 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 the atmosphere of this story without even knowing all the details. And especially in Honor's case, because she didn't see even the 30 page document that I wrote. She didn't know what was going to happen from moment to moment in the story until she was in the scene um, itself. And so, uh, but yet you carried so much um, of Julie and so much of myself in a way that I recognize and, the, and there is no way, there's no way you, you, can, you could know those things. So there must be something that happens. Yeah. So I, I, you know, it, it, I can't really pinpoint it. Um, uh, it's, yeah, there's a bit, there's a little bit of, mystery and magic yeah. in there. It was an honor to experience these, these experiences and these scenes, if you will, in, in my own time and in my, it felt like it was really, really happening. And that was such a fantastic way to work for me who didn't know any, any different, who had never had another experience of being in a film. So that was, that was completely new to me and that's, that's all I know, and it was, it was wonderful. It was really wonderful. Well, Tilda, I'd love to hear your point of view. I mean, you've some, you're somebody who's worked with many, many filmmakers, many different you know, methods, and, and what, what's your take on, on, on this particular process? It really makes me wonder why anybody uh, works any, any other way, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, it's, there are nerve-wracking elements, but there's something energetic that happens. We, what Joanna does is she makes authors of all of us. And, and so you are carrying the narrative and you are, you know, every time you decide to speak, it's like what I'm doing now. I'm, I know roughly what I want to say, but I'm having to bring the words out and encounter my own inarticulacy and that's what people do but very rarely in films that are beautifully written by great screenwriters do you actually see particularly very good performers uh, doing that you see them being very articulate all the time and saying very written things and so what you get when you have these raw animal people blundering around in a, in, a, in, a, in a set of Joannas is you get people really alive. And so the experience of it from our point of view is um, it's incredibly lively and, and creative. The thing that I find really interesting as, a, as an objective eye is when I first saw the cut, I was so amazed as maybe we all are at how precise it is yeah. because given that it's it's sort of drummed up in this mystical fashion, slightly ramshackle fashion, you would imagine. Mm -hmm. it's, and this has, of course, got a lot to do with how beautifully it's cut. But 
somehow round about take four, there's a sort of rhythm. It's like making music. There's a sort of music that exerts itself. And people know enough what they're doing, but they're still on their toes, that there's this perfect elision. And that's the take that's in the film. Um, you know, the first take is very often a bit crackers because Joanna will say, okay, the scene is you're all in the Walter Reed Theatre and you come onto the stage and Dennis is going to ask you some questions. Action. And you do it. And then she says, cut. Okay, so next time, can you do it sort of like that, but can Dennis maybe jump up in the middle and run out? And can somebody in the audience throw a tomato? <laughs> and then you do that. And then she says, okay, cut. Now the next one, maybe the tomato comes a bit later. And Dennis, maybe you fall on the floor. And then somehow, with these very few pieces of direction, in amongst this mayhem, you get this middle point. It's like a Venn diagram. You get this little thin strand of coherence. And that's what, and that's what she chooses. But it's, it is extraordinary sometimes the chaos at the beginning sometimes that's irresistible where no one knows where, where no one knows where they're going to uh, walk or yeah. what uh, what position they have I, I, I don't want to miss that first chaos yeah um, because sometimes it just all comes together then but so you shoot chronologically obviously you have to for this for this to work um, so and you there's no written dialogue or, or are, there, are there certain phrases, certain words you want the actress to hit, or? Well, there are, I mean, it's, it's so hard to sum up this. The, the, there, are, there, are, there are, yeah, there are certain phrases that are very important. And, I mean, an example is at the end of the film, um, the, 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 actually, the end, the end of the film, the, the way the events unfold is very like, as I remember them unfolding. And there were certain words and certain phrases and Rosalind, um, uh, Julie's mother, says th says the worst when she, when she comes down the stairs after the phone call. Well, that was the, the worst were the words that had to be said at that point. And then shortly afterwards, Rosalind um, says uh, talks about the detail of how Anthony died because Julie didn't hear the phone call and that it happened in the Wallace collection. And that so though so that's an example of of, of words that needed to be said. But then there are a lot of other instances where there isn't that need, and I'm searching for some other kind of truth within the film. And I've, uh, when I have to say, whenever I, I, I do try and script something, that this the example I gave isn't 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 this case. But I uh, when I write something down, because sometimes I find I'm working with an actor or a non-actor who wants a bit more from me, so they want to see something written down, and I'll think, I, you know, I have to sort of tailor things to different people, different personalities. So I'll write a scene and then, and then, but then I realize as soon as I've given it to them and as soon as they've said those words that it's just, there's, there's, there's a sort of, the, there are kind of breaks put on. It just doesn't really sing and doesn't, as Tilda says, it doesn't have the life that I want. It's so important that there's something that feels really, it's not even about reality, but it's just got to feel kind of buzzy and alive. And I find, yeah, written dialogue, um, yeah, I mean, there's, I, I'm not denying the wonderful scripts that have been written and the wonderful films that have wonderful dialogue in, but I think in the way that I work and what I'm interested in, I'm just looking for something that sort of goes beyond that. The scene um, between Julie and Anthony, one of their early first scenes together, that was written, I assume, where they're talking about, well, he's talking really more than she is about, you know, what he wants in, in films, you know, life as it is versus life as it is experienced, because I feel like that in a way is sort of, con is connected to your process or like ideas that you're working with. Well, actually that also wasn't precisely written and it was, um, I mean, uh, Anthony and uh, Tom Burke playing Anthony mm -hmm. was very much driving those scenes because that's what's happening at the beginning of their relationship. But I'd spent, I mean, unlike some of my casting process, I cast Tom quite a few months right. before we started filming. So we had a lot of meetings together to talk about the character he was going to play. And I showed him a lot. Uh, I even had voice re a voice recording that he listened to of the real character 
um, and letters and, and, and a lot of things. So he really immersed himself in that character. I mean, he dug really deep. I mean, you can see what an amazing performance he gives. He really, you know, that is really from sort of deep inside him. So once he digested all that information and I talked about this first meeting that I had with this man in this relationship, um, and, and about how I was, uh, my project was criticized and, you know, really very much what happens to Julie in the film. And he, so he listened to all of this and he drunk in everything, but then I'm not giving him, I'm not writing down that dialogue on a bit of paper. He's, it's just, it's, it's taken in in a different way. It's understood in a different way. Um, it's a less intellectual process in a way. Can you talk a little bit about casting honor? Well, <laughs> Because <laughs> I understand Tilda was attached first, right? Uh, Tilda was attached first, which I guess is a risky thing to do when you haven't found the daughter. <laughs> but time went by. I met uh, a lot of uh, actresses, actors, non-actors, um, to play Julie, and I and I just felt that they were they were actresses. They weren't artists, and I really wanted Julie to be someone. I was talking about this earlier. I really wanted. Um, Julie to be someone who's much more comfortable in front of the camera than in front of it. And so the actresses I would meet, I thought, well, they're good at being in front of the camera. That's, what, that's where they're comfortable and that's what they like. But I wanted a, someone who really, yeah, it didn't, they didn't have to be making films necessarily, but be writing or, or, or thinking um, or painting. And, and Honor's very creative and very, you know, and you write. And so she... Yes, I felt, and hadn't been in front of the camera before. Um, but, but yes, it, it, it occurred, because I went up to Scotland to talk to Tilda about playing Rosalind, and I was asking everybody, but also I asked Tilda, you know, do you know any young women <laughs> <laughs> who, who has this quality? And, and we were very different. I mean, in the early 80s, young women were very different to how they are now. So I kept being confronted with these very contemporary young women who spend all their time on their phones and on FaceTime and, and I felt honor, well maybe honor you do a little bit of that too, but you, you, I felt that you, you had something that I recognized um, of myself at that time. Um, and so we, yes, it was a very tentative thing because we, you know, Tilda and I talked and then, you know, honor, I, I, honor, was, honor was there. Um, honor yeah. was present, but uh, I was mentioning the children of all my friends all honors friends, everybody I could think of. And then this moment came when uh, Joanna and I kind of looked at each other and said, I think there's something that we're not saying to each other. Um, <laughs> there's somebody we haven't mentioned. Um, and uh, yes, that was very, very close to the wire. That was about two weeks before shooting started. Mm. And, and, and there was a moment on Berwick upon Tweed um, yeah. train station where I was getting on a train to go back to London after talking to Tilda about Rosalind and Honor was getting off the train to come home and we had, I don't know, it was only about 10 minutes between trains and we, um, we just had a lovely conversation. Um, it wasn't about the film even, it wasn't about Julie but just Honor was talking about her life and as she was talking, I was watching her and I just, something just, I thought, hmm, yeah, there's Julie there. <laughs> um, but I, but we were very delicate about it. I didn't, I, I didn't want to assume that it was something that Honor would want to do. And it was a very big commitment because it's not just one film, it's two films. So it was, it was something we all took very seriously. Honor, can you say a bit about the process? Obviously, it sounds like it was necessarily a different process than how Joanna worked with Tom, who had been you know, cast months ago and, and you had lots of conversations. And if you were cast two weeks before the start of shooting, what, what does working together involve? How do you immerse yourself in this character? I know Joanna very well and it was very necessary for Julie to be very in the dark in her life. I mean, she really, really is very lost in many ways and so it was quite good that I was very lost because I think you could really sense that I was a bit kind of really, really not knowing what's going on. And that worked really well for me um, as that I had so much trust and so much excitement and curiosity and enthusiasm for what we were doing that I was just, it was such an adventure to be involved in and, and to, it was, 
it was like living a whole different path to myself and it was just it was really exciting to wake up every day and come to set and not know what was going to happen that day and whether or not I was going to be thrown off a bridge or you know anything I, I had absolutely no idea and that was just that's in part two maybe. I was going to say it's part two <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you did know a little bit I mean you didn't know the story but you knew I, I showed Anna um, my photographs and some films and diaries, quite very personal things. So you had you 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 knew you had a sense of who Julie was, mm. but you didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah, and I had a sense of how she developed over time. Although that was a very personal journey for myself, as I got to know Tom better and as I got to know the character better, in my own um, my own translation of that, um, which Joanna was so 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 encouraging and so supportive and wonderful with me finding my own my own little sort of translation i want to say of of, of julie so i was very i felt so safe on set really with everybody involved joanna can you say a bit about how this this process um extends to your other you know your your crew, I guess, and this 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 process of figuring things out on the set. Does do you work with your cinematographer the same way? Because the film is also like like all your work, it, it's it's very precise um, in its visual language. But I, I but I think working with the crew is also there's a certain amount of improvisation with that too, and and with um, with with this film, I uh, I worked with a new cinematographer which was quite scary for me because I was, um, I was hoping I was going to work with the cinematographer from my previous two films. Um, and I tend to like working with the same people and I like a feeling of sort of security and safety working, yeah, just working with the same family, really. And, and so one member of the family um, wasn't available um, and it was a very, I mean, it was, a, it, it was like a, sort of relationship breakout up just before making the film. I, I, I thought, well, maybe this, something's going to go wrong and this isn't going to work out. So I was really challenged. And so um, a new member of the team uh, um, materialized in the form of David Redeker, who, uh, I, well, it turned out to be a wonderful, uh, another, a wonderful new relationship and, and made me realize actually I can work with new people and that I shouldn't be too sort of huddled around my my family, it's good to, you know, it's good to bring something new in. And he, um, but he came in, well, rather like honor, he came in just a few weeks, I think maybe just only slightly more than you, about two and a half weeks before the shoot. So we didn't have time to prepare very much. Not that I do, I mean, I don't storyboard or anything like that, but I certainly like spending time with my collaborators and talking about references and talking a lot about the story. So we didn't have that time. So we had a very accelerated pre-production um, sitting around the table of, our, of the house we were living in in Norfolk. And um, so we were still figuring out our relationship when we started shooting, but it actually felt very, um, it was very, um, I don't want it easy, doesn't sound quite right, but it was sort of easy and very natural. And, and he, um, yeah, the communication, it was, it was yeah, it seemed quite straightforward where to put the camera and what to do and, and, and the sort of quality of light. And, and the, a lot of the references for the film are, are previous um, films or photographs of mine. So we were, we were, we were looking, um, it sounds sort of very kind of interior in a way, but we were sort of looking at back at my older work and using that as a springboard for the new work. Were you trying to do something a little bit different in terms of the, the look of the film? It, it seems like there's, Maybe if the camera gets a little closer than in your previous work, does that have to do with the nature of the film, the nature of your your actress, or some, something? Does it was it does well, seem slightly different from your previous work? That, that was quite a conscious thing. I thought, well, I've I've, I've sort of fallen out of love of the sort of wide long shot uh, lasting forever. <laughs> I, maybe that's how you all interpreted it anyway. But I was trying to get away from that. And, and, and I wanted to look at Honor, I wanted to look at Julie and, 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 and really see her and I felt that I needed to isolate her, see her on her own and see her, see her, um, yeah, see her up close 
Um, but I, yes, there were a lot of new, new things I was trying out. I was working again on six, Super 16, which I hadn't worked on uh, with since, uh, almost since film school, actually, because my other films have all been digital. So that was a real pleasure. It wasn't all shot on Super 16, but, but a, a, a big chunk of it was. And I loved, actually, the, the discipline of that and not being able to keep the camera rolling forever, that it was the, the, the sort of rituals around shooting film, not for nostalgic reasons, but just actually because the process is so much more interesting. All right, we're going to take some audience questions for Joanna, Honor, or Tilda. I find it admirable, Joanna, that you're focusing on a chapter of your past and that at the same time you're not exactly bringing focus. The film is delightfully inscrutable beginning to end and I think that the way you film your people and keep them in some sort of vague spaces that are never really buttoned down to the nth degree as we would in a classical narrative is really admirable. But along the way you did discover something about your past and I wonder how that dovetails with your urge to make a second film and where the second film is rooted in the first because you must have come to some point of greater clarity in this process, or maybe not. Or maybe you, it is your talent to keep things away from sharp focus. Um, yeah, I think I, 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 I was struggling to sort of hear all, all of what you said, but it's, it, it sounds really interesting, and I, and I, and I sort of get, um, I think I understand, yeah, you, 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 that you, that I'm sort of not putting things in sharp focus all the time, or may, maybe I understand as not explaining everything. And, Yes. Yes, yes. Well, in the second film, I don't really want to say too much of it uh, now because uh, also because of the way that I work, I don't know everything myself yet. <laughs> but but it but it it, it, it something is is coming into focus. It's true, and there is a, there is an exploration um, of the character of Julie and trying to understand her and how and her part in the relationship with Anthony. So that uh, yes, I'm 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 interested in doing that. I don't know if that I'm really answering your question. I think we, we, I think the the point maybe was about if I understood it, it was like this question of sharpness is interesting too because um, there I think there's a paradoxical quality to the film. There's something very precise, as we said, and very clear-eyed about it. But there's also there is a sense in which it does seem sort of couched in memory or reverie or, or, or something, you know, um, and, and I think that that is a really interesting effect that you achieve. Um, and I'm wondering if that was just, that was very conscious from, from the start. And, and I think that it's, just, it's quite a different tone from your, from your other films. And I'm definitely aware, aware of it being a different tone and, and, and exploring different ways of expressing a story. And I feel that it's more narrative than my, there's more narrative in it than the other films. Um, I don't know whether, uh, as you describe it, being sort of, yeah, very precise, but also not sort of uh, slightly distant. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think I have a tendency anyway not to like to explain. I don't want to sh the thing to be too clear. I want, it's not even that I want some mystery, but I want, I want there to be, well, space for you as an audience to interpret it. But, um, but at the same time, I don't know. I'm, I, I find it very hard to. Someone was asking me today about the first meeting uh, of, of um, when, when Julie meets Anthony at her party, and that I didn't have the scene where they get introduced, or you know, you see them, you, you suddenly see them sitting there talking with each other. And I don't think it was a criticism exactly, but it was. But it made me think how I didn't, how it doesn't interest me to see that meeting of mm. them because it, that's just. Somehow, it's not even that it's a convention, narrative convention, but I wanted it just to be in the way that one experiences life. You're suddenly in a situation where you're doing something or you're talking to someone. Um, I, didn't, I didn't need to see the mechanics behind it, so, yeah. I think uh, it's really interesting, this question of clarity. Um, I mean, when you were talking about what it may have brought you to uh, share when you were putting things together with me who was there at the time as well. I would say it wasn't that our conversations brought you any more clarity. What it actually did was gave you license to not really be able to remember. You know, it's, it's, it's almost more about peripheral vision than about a kind of clarity. And it's about memory. It's about somebody 
making a film about an, their memory of an experience. It's not even about the experience. It's about the memory of their experience 30 years ago, which is a very amorphous and elliptical and porous kind of phenomenon. And um, it's not really about clarity, I think. Uh, it's a different kind of... Or rather, it's the, it's the acceptance that clarity is impossible. Like articulacy. <laughs> um, yes, here in the third row. Yep, the microphone is right there. Hi, um, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you for all your work on that. Um, my question is for Honor. Um, how did you feel portraying a girl coming of age in like a completely different time period? Because do you? Th I mean, not super long ago, but like she's coming of age with different kinds of things around her. So do you think like her journey will be different today or what, what did you think about that? Such a good question, thank you. I feel like I'm from the 80s anyway. Um, Me too. Because, I mean, we, I grew up without a TV, kind of, and I just grew up watching films and things like that. So that kind of felt quite familiar and I grew up listening to David Bowie and 80s music, so that came quite naturally to me. Um, <laughs> um, that's such a good question. I'm trying to. It would be very different now, I think. Although, I mean, I think Julie, in, in her own way, is quite timeless and quite sort of. Gosh, I'm not expressing myself very well, but she, I think, in any in any time, I think she'd be. Very. Old-fashioned, but also very kind of futuristic and very kind of, yeah. Because she just, she seems quite, to me, she seems um, almost quite un un unsettled in her own time. So, I mean, it's almost like she's from the past or from the future, but in any age, in any year um, or time, I feel like she'd feel like that. But I'm trying to find a good way to answer your question. Um, so, um, but that's a really nice way of, of describing her, that she's someone who's not comfortable mm. in her own time. She's sort of out, out, out of time, which I've certainly felt. I felt out of time, out of place, very awkward. Mm. So that, I think that's really interesting. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Was there a hand up there? Um, is it, was it me? Okay. Uh, I'm curious, Joanna, um, what was the significance to you or um, I guess to the content of the film itself uh, of her getting sick in the middle? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. That, that's come up a few times. Um, I, yeah, that was quite the thing that was questioned. I, uh, well, it was something that I remembered, but that doesn't mean that it's justified in the film. But I wanted the, the little specter of AIDS in there. And that was something that was just beginning to be in one's consciousness at that point in the, in the sort of early, it was around 80, 84. And uh, the idea that I don't take it further again, I'm so uninterested in, in, in sort of drama in a sense or plot, but I wanted that, I, rem I remembered that, that, and I wanted this sense of, well, is Anthony sleeping around? What, you know, what is it that Julie has? Is there some connection to AIDS? You know, could it be something more serious? So I suppose I wanted to just plant in there the idea that something, yeah, some, something could happen, but then of course that thing that you think might happen doesn't happen, so it's not exactly a red herring, but I, I, I yes, I'm just interested, again, it's like life, you know, things happen and then they go away, they don't, they, they, there aren't necessarily reverberations, so that's just a moment in time in their relationship that, that seemed important to depict. Yep, right there. Thank you for that exquisite, exquisite film. Um, you co-organized a, a um, Chantal Ackerman retrospective and then wrote one of the most beautiful tributes I've seen on her. And I was wondering, did you have any sense of Ackerman while you were making this film or in your film work? Uh, actually, not specifically. That, doing that, that um, work of, of uh, that slow re retrospective um, I did with Adam Roberts, um, um, 
a couple of years ago was, was very much something, I felt like I was doing, it was like a different job in a way. I wasn't connecting it to my own filmmaking. And this isn't to say I'm not an admirer, I, well, I am obviously a huge admirer of, uh, of Chantal Ackerman, but I wasn't, the purpose of it wasn't to feed my own films. It was a very separate thing. And I, um, and I really enjoyed that. It was a really satisfying thing to do, but it wasn't for any, yeah, it wasn't for kind of selfish reasons in a way. It was because that I, I wanted, we felt, Adam and I, that Chantal's work in the UK hadn't been shown very much at all, just maybe Jean Dillman, her first film, but not, you know, that, not very much beyond that. And, and it, was a, it was a voyage of discovery because I hadn't realized quite what an amazing body of work she had. And the idea was to show her work over two years, which is something that never happens because you get a retrospective, but it's over a weekend. So that, um, but that was an incredibly satisfying thing to do, but it didn't, it, it, it Yes, it, well, I know if this sounds strange, it wasn't connected to my own filmmaking. It was a separate thing that I did, and I would like to do more, more of that, um, if that's possible. Yeah. I, I actually thought of Ackerman, too, because, I mean, for many things, but there's your, your fondness for interiors, which you share with her, and also this turn to autobiography, which is something that she explored throughout her career in, in sort of different registers. Um, but it's interesting to say that, you know, as you were working on this, you were doing the Ackerman retrospective at the same time. Yeah. Well, it was, it, the, there was actually, it was after ex making exhibition, right. and, and since last being here in a way, making, uh, doing the retrospective, and, and not just the retrospective on Ackerman, but doing, showing other films as part of this collective. And then it sort of filled this gap that I have between films. And then s the souvenir came. Uh, yeah, it was a kind of a, a, you know, a sort of not necessarily parallel thing, but it but yeah, came out of a different energy. And I, yes, I, I'm, maybe there are parallels, but I guess I'm not seeking them out. And I'm not, yeah, I'm not looking at her films with that kind of lens for myself. Okay. Um, yeah, we have a question in the front. How long did the uh, how long did it take to edit the film, and at what point do you start thinking about music? Um, it, we, it, it took eight months to edit, so it was quite a long time, and we kept asking for more time. I think we had five or six months, and then we it just needed a lot of time. And the music, well, some of the music was already there. Um, I mean, even when we were shooting, I mean, there was the scene that we did um, where where um, towards the end of the film where we have Glenn Miller. Um, playing and that was a very risky thing to do because I, I thought sometimes I think when you're shooting a scene um, I want a, a, a sort of choreography, choreography or a sort of musical response to something so playing an actual piece of music while you're shooting to get get a certain mood and so we use that piece of music in that scene um, uh, when they're waiting for Anthony to come home and, but I didn't, I had, didn't have the rights of it at that point, so it was a really crazy thing to do. And the sound recorders was really worried, and, and so of course we did a take without the music, but then I didn't want use, use that take in the end, I wanted the take um, with the piece of music, and in, in the end we managed to clear it, which was great. And so the music you hear in the film is the, because Tilda's singing over it, it, it is, is actually the music that was recorded at the time in the, in, 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 in the location where we were working. Um, and then some music uh, came afterwards. The, the only contemporary bit of music is the Anna Calvi piece, which is over the end credits. And that was a different um, process because Anna, I knew I wanted Anna to contribute to the film, but I wasn't quite sure where. And then it, um, I thought, well, it would be really nice right at the very end because it was to do with, I wanted a p her to write a piece of music that was about Julie's future in a sense. And so she, um, uh, I made sure that she could watch the film um, and respond to it musically straight away. So she, she, um, she um, privately, and I didn't want to be even an observer myself, although I was fascinated to see what would happen, but she, we made sure that she was in a, in a place where she could record straight away and that she had her guitar with her and she could record her voice. So that was literally her first response after watching the film. Um, so that was, yeah. Uh, right in front here. I found it fascinating what you did with the costumes because 
Julie is dressed like at least three totally different people, depending on who she's with. There's the vertigo Venice dress, and then there's her with the family and her as a film student. Could you talk a bit about the costumes? I wonder if you want to say anything, Anna. But, um, she, I mean, it was, it was different phases of Julie's life. So she dresses a particular way at the beginning with her friends before she meets Anthony. Um, and she's wearing, I mean, you were wearing some of the clothes that I wore at the time. There's, a, there's um, World's End, um, uh, Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren had this shop on the King's Road called World's End. And I think we both went there. <laughs> it had a clock going round backwards. And the scarf that's used, I really like the scarf because it's sort of repurposed in the film. First of all, Julie's wearing it. Um, then, um, then one of her friends wears it, plays with it, um, Frankie. And then Anthony dances with it. So it's, uh, and you can see the tassels are sort of falling off it. And that's because, it, well, it's more than 30 years old. Obviously, look much newer at the time. Um, but Anthony has a big influence over Julie um, and how she, how she dresses and how she appears. And he almost makes her into a sort of Hitchcockian heroine in a way. That was something we thought about, um, that she becomes a protagonist in his film or, or, or their joint film. And so the, 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 the vertigo gray suit was also based on a suit that I had made for a trip to Venice. And um, so, that, so, so that, um, and then there's the ball dress that she wears. That wasn't based on anything I had, actually. That was our own fantasy. But the, yes, her, she, she changes how she looks um, through the film. And then after Anthony dies, she's, yeah, um, becomes, yeah, again, changes. But under the grey suit and the amazing dress is a corset that I had to be like sucked into. And that, I feel like, was very good for this sense of real constraint and real kind of very old-fashioned feminine, um, just being sucked in and feeling not quite loose in yourself. Um, but, so that helped me to feel so uncomfortable in those... <laughs> in those moments. Um, so I feel like that, that really did its purpose. It looks great, though. The what's it looks great, though. Thank you. <laughs> and so do you, Tilda. In the, these, I thought they were wonderful, those dresses as well. Someone we know, right. the, a lot of the clothes for both, uh, both Honor and for Rosalind are um, they're, they're the real McCoy. Uh, Joanna and I were just talking uh, before the screening about raiding our long, long undiscovered attic uh, things for stuff from the early 90s. You wear my shoes at one point, I think, in the film. And, and your dress. And my dress, yeah. yeah. And yeah. your trousers. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to know at this point who owns what <laughs> in the film. Firstly, uh, gratitude, and then my question, gratitude to you, Miss Swinton. Uh, you took my film lover's heart about 24 years ago when I was a senior in undergrad and I saw Orlando, and I've been following you since. And from Orlando to I Am Love to Snowpiercer to tonight's performance in The Souvenir, thank you for, for being here with us. Thank you for the integrity that you bring to each and every role. And speaking, speaking of tonight's performance, uh, it finally clicked why I'm so besotted with your performances. I think the line at the dinner, at uh, the birthday dinner, was, it's really qu quite complicated, or is that the line? It's really very complicated. It's really very complicated. Before Rosalind says it, she has this expression, she looks so pregnant with thought. She looks pregnant with thought the whole movie, every, every time she's, you're on screen. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about uh, what is she thinking? What, because she always, she's holding back always from giving her her full response. And I think it's brilliant the way you convey that uh, on the screen. Thank you very much. And you're very welcome, by the way. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, Rosalind is a very, very tender opportunity for me, um, not only because Joanna is literally, not that she's old, but literally my oldest friend. And um, I've been with her hand in hand um, through everything, but also um, those mothers uh, mean a lot to me. And the way in which those mothers um, and I meet, when I say they, I'm actually specifically referring to the mothers of both Joanna and me. Um, they didn't say half of what they could. And it's still a mysterious journey to try and imagine what they could have said. Um, but for sure, they didn't say it all. Um, they didn't even come close. And being, holding back, cooking roast chicken and making sure that your daughter has enough money to get by and not asking the questions that you might ask, fruitfully, by the way, um, and not speaking up when you disagree with your husband, except once maybe at this strange lunch. Um, that's a sort of atmosphere and a landscape that I know very well. And um, you know, as life goes on, one becomes more and more interested in these landscapes that one recognizes. And uh, so this opportunity, not only obviously to work with my great friend, but to look at that portrait is really precious to me. And I'm very much looking forward to souvenir number two. And I'm, I'm very interested in, in seeing how much more we might be able to find out about what Rosalind might say. Who knows? She may not say much more, but I'm, I'm, I'm as interested as you are, maybe. I'm getting the sign that we have to wrap up, but um, I, just, I do have to sort of ask you, I know you don't want to say very much about part two, but you are shooting in less than a month. <laughs> so, um, and both of you are in it. Um, can you give us something? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Anything. Just a little. Uh, I'm feeling a little anxious about that uh, we're about to do this. Um, it's, uh, well, it's, it's, uh, it, it starts um, where this one left off. So we're going into the future, and we go into the future a few years, and we really uh, see Julie um, digesting um, um, responding to what has happened to her, and but responding in a in a in a cinematic way. So it's uh, there there are, there are sort of more stories within stories in the second part, and it's um, I think maybe it feels like a little bit more complex in some ways in terms of its structure. But yes, there's there's um, uh, the next part of Julie's journey, and it's very much um, yeah that Anthony is very much behind that, even though he's not there anymore. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's how to take your life into your work. I've said a lot more than I, I should have done. But the dogs are going to be in it, <laughs> aren't they? We're, yeah, and we're yeah. working out the schedule of the dogs because yeah, they've got a lot of traveling to do. All right, we have to wrap it up. But thank you all for being here with us. And uh, thank you so much.